Green 01, David the Real Man White here. So we have seen a lot of arguments from mostly anti-Christian, generally right-wing people about how Christianity is this weak, cucked religion. Is this true? Is Christianity really a weak, cucked religion? No. And for this video, we're going to be covering the objections. These are going to be more of the general objections that we see from these people, from the neo-pagans, and so on and so forth. And analyzing that, we're going to be making our case that Christianity is definitely not a quote-unquote cucked religion. So one argument that I want to cover is the Marcionite argument, right? Some of these people will say, well, Christianity cannot be true because the Old Testament God and the New Testament God, are, you know, they're different. They push different doctrines. And this is nothing new. This is this was argued by Marcion of Sinop. And the way I will show a continuity between the Old and the New Testament is through ver there's various different ways. There's Old Testament prophets. There's Old Testament prophecies that predict Christ, that predict the Messiah. And in the New Testament, we say that the Messiah is Jesus Christ himself. And Jesus Christ himself affirms that. He says to uh, the Pharisees that before Abraham was, I am. So he, he's saying, I existed before Abraham. And the Jews, and by saying I am, the Pharisees understood it, it as him uh, saying that he's basically co-equal with God. And that's why they considered it as blasphemy. Any other sort of interpretation just does not make sense. And one common mistake that people do in regards to the Old and the New Testament and with Jesus is that they think Jesus is only in the New Testament. He's only in the New Testament. He's not in the Old Testament. That's wrong. Jesus is in the Old Testament. The same person that gives the law to Moses is the same person that preaches the gospel in the New Testament. They're the same people. They're the same person. And one particular character that's very important for this case is the angel of the Lord. Now, the angel of the Lord is not a mere angel. Angel means messenger. So, technically, it's actually the messenger of the Lord. In a way, you could say it's the word of the Lord. And this word of the Lord, this messenger of the Lord, uh, also declares himself God in the burning bush and other places. Certain characters in the Bible refers to the angel of the Lord as God. So Hagar will be one of the examples. Hagar, after conversating with the angel of the Lord, says, I have seen God. Uh, Jacob wrestles with God. Right? Who are these people? Well, it's the pre-incarnate Christ. And one interesting thing regarding Hagar and seeing God will be Exodus. Uh, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, it is said that no one has seen God's God and lived. So how can Moses speak to God face to fa face as Exodus chapter 33 verse 11 says? How can he speak to God face to face and then no one can see God? This doctrine only makes sense with Trinitarian theology. If you're talking about one person, if there's only one person, there's a clear contradiction. And many, actually many Jewish scholars uh, in the Old Testament period has actually argued for this. So this is not something new cooked up. There were uh, priests, Pharisees were debating. They were they were saying maybe there's like multiple gods. I mean, they, then they will use the argument. Well, they, they say are. They use plural in, in the first chapter of Genesis. We shall make man in our image. Uh, why is he saying we? Or why is... Why... How do we make sense of these things? So you saw a prototype of the, of the Trinity in these argumentations. And again, as I will say, these these things will only make sense with Trinitarian theology. So you can't see God uh, is pretty much akin to you can't see God the Father. You can't see the essence of God and so on and so forth. But you can obviously uh, speak to the pre-incarnate word and the incarnate word. And finally, we could even say that in Exodus 23, God says, my name is in that angel. So the angel, that messenger, is pretty much co-equal with God. The next objection that I would like to go for 
is turning the other cheek. Now this is pretty popular. Um, this is one of the more basic objections. A lot of people have problems with it. It seems like a lot of people don't really like this doctrine at all. How they think that this preaches tolerance, this pre preaches weakness. And some of them will even note that this goes against Old Testament. Now, what, what does turn, turn the other cheek mean? Well, it means that you shall not return evil with evil. And also, further on, it is said that we should love our enemies. And again, most anti-Christian right-wingers don't really like this. Now, the claim that this is not seen in the Old Testament is wrong. As a matter of fact, most if not all teachings of the Sermon of the Mount is actually from the Old Testament. So we'll use this turning, uh, turning the other cheek as an example. Do not return for evil for evil. Well, Proverbs chapter 20 says that. Proverbs chapter 20 verse 22. Loving your enemies, helping them, feeding them. Proverbs chapter 25 verse 21. So in the Old Testament, all of these doctrines, loving your enemy, that's in the Old Testament. Did Jesus just came it came up with it? No. It is in the scriptures. And in regards to turning the other cheek, I've always given this argument. It's person is talking it's in the context of personal enemies. Do we turn the other do we turn the other cheek for enemies of the faith, enemies of the church? open enemies of the church the clearest example i will give uh, is our heretics like arius did we turn the other cheek to arius not at all we excommunicated we deposed arius we got rid of arius we told him to screw off go somewhere else same with nestorius same with various different heretics so at times yes you should turn the other cheek but for your personal enemies and I will pretty much completely back this up. If we return evil with evil, you're an idiot. Because all you're going to do is you're going to create this eternal cycle where you do something evil to him and he does something evil to you. And so you get mad, you do something evil to him. And it just goes on and on and on and on and on. And it doesn't end. So at one time, you do have to turn the other cheek. Otherwise, you're going to hurt yourself and you're going to hurt the other side. You're going to hurt each, each other. <clears throat> now, another charge is pacifism. Christianity is this pacifist religion. Jesus was this like Jewish hippie. And he was preaching love and pacifism and tolerance. And this is only looking at one side of his preaching. And of course, our God is a God of love. But that doesn't mean... That we share the same view of life. I mean, when we say love, we don't mean the same kind of love that most people today think. We have a different understanding of love. And when it comes to pacifism, there are many examples in the scripture, but also in Christian nations, Christian imperiums. So, straight right off the bat, in the Old Testament, there's a death penalty for murder. Saint Paul himself, in his epistle to Romans chapter 13, says that the magistrate, that the state, has the power of the sword. Now, is this sword a piñata? Is the magistrate just singing the sword? No, he's using that sword. And Saint Paul even goes on to say that if I have violated the law and done something against the law and I'm deserving of death, I support it. He says that he has no problems with death penalty even for himself. That's how much he supports it. And Jesus himself advocates for death penalty for offenders of the little ones. And he says, it's better if you were hanged by your neck and thrown into the sea. Uh, and these little ones, well, they refer to children. So if you're a pedophile, Jesus is saying, yeah, you, you, should, you deserve a death penalty. But at the same time, this also goes for those of childlike faith, or those that are pretty much noobs to the faith. And if you mislead those people that are noobs to the Christian faith, he's saying, you're deserving of death, sir. <laughs> and examples with Imperium will be St. Justinian. Now, St. Justinian 
if you look at his expansive empire, is anything but pacifist. But in Orthodox Church, he's a saint. And not even a Roman Catholic, only in the Orthodox Church, he's actually a saint, as far as to my knowledge. And if you look at the Church Fathers, we can still see some sort of pro death penalty argumentation. So, Saint Athanasius, I believe, in letter 48. Uh, says that war can be just or right, there can be just war now contra Roman Catholics He's not arguing for holy war. He's not saying war can be holy. No, where do we see that in uh, church uh, fathers Nowhere do we see them saying that war is holy that there can be holy wars But he is saying that war can be just right so killing the enemy during war can be just so in certain cases he is saying that killing a person sometimes is the good thing to do. And yes, that's what Christianity says. So in some terms, yes, there is an aspect of mercy, there is an aspect of tolerance. We don't murder, uh, killing, that's the last resort. But that's what it is. It's, it's a last resort. It's not a no resort. It's a last resort. So it's still an option. So no, we're not pacifists. We don't, we don't sit and let people destroy us. That's not the teaching of Christianity. Christianity is against that teaching. Multiculturalism. This is, this is one of those that really piss me off. Uh, people will use Galatians three twenty eight and they'll say, look, Christianity is multiculturalist. You, Paul says there is neither Jew nor Greek. And this is really, this really gets on my nerves because. If you read the full passage, St. Paul also says there is neither slave nor free, neither male nor female. But obviously, unless you're, you're very crazy, and unless you're incredibly dishonest, you will not argue that St. Paul is saying there is no such thing as male nor female. Obviously. Obviously he's not saying that. So, if... If St. Paul believes that there can still be genders, and if, if male and female does exist, if St. Paul believes that you can be a slave and you can be free, then St. Paul naturally believes that you can be a Jew or you can be a Greek. <laughs> so it's the opposite. So St. Paul is actually affirming that people groups exist. <laughs> So the, the, this argument completely backfires, and in another way, there's another aspect where it also backfires, is regards to Christian Zionism. Now we will get now we, we're getting to Christian Zionism. So one of the arguments that it refutes, uh, no, 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 where it refutes Christian Zionism is the fact that it's saying there is neither Jew nor Greek. He is saying that God shows no favoritism. There is no favoritism in God. And yes, he's completely correct. There is no favoritism in God. So this chosen people nonsense, completely wrong. So wait a minute. But isn't there an aspect of being chosen? Yes. There are chosen peoples. Are Jews chosen people? Nope. So who are the chosen people? The chosen people are those that believe in God, that believe in the promise, that have faith in God. And this is even in the Old Testament, this is, there is the notion that uh, being chosen is based on faith. Because there are many people in the, in the Old Testament that, that were Jewish, but they were not quote-unquote chosen. So we can understand that being this chosen people does uh, you're not chosen by ethnicity and this completely refutes christian zionism i only have a video that refutes christian zionism but it also refutes those that think that we're jew worshipers no we're not jew worshipers not at all and christian zionism itself is a recent teaching it's a recent teaching in evangelicalism orthodoxy and to be fair roman catholicism both have consistently been against zionism and then the question will be very wait a second there is the israel in the old testament how is the israel in the old testament different from the israel in the modern world how are they any different same ethnicity same faith no they're not the same faith 
Israel in the Messianic age is the church. Israel are those that believe in God. The modern state that calls itself Israel, they don't believe in God. They reject the Messiah. So we don't have the same fate. And some people think that we kind of share a heritage of faith. No, 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 not at all. You see, we do have same prophets, but we also have the same prophets with Muslims. Do we share the same fate with Muslims? No. They have completely different. So it's a fan fiction. All right. So likewise, we don't have a shared heritage of faith with Jews. And as a matter of fact, Revelation 2 9 and 3 9 both says that those that call themselves Jews, but in reality are not, are the synagogue of Satan. So who are those people that call themselves Jews, but in reality are not? People that don't believe in God. So who are the real Jews? Technically, it's us because we are Israel. So we are, quote unquote, the real Jews. Does that mean that we are like, like Israel was this like white nationalist uh, dream project? No, no, the Hebrews are not English, French, Western European people. That's not what we're saying. We're arguing that being part of Israel is based on faith, it's not based on ethnicity. And finally, this is perhaps the most popular objection. You worship a Jew, Christ cunk. <laughs> you worship a Jew, that means your religion is wrong, kiddo. The first thing I will note <clears throat> is that this argument is uh, fallacious. It's, it's the genetical fallacy. Just because, okay, just because Jesus was, was, was Jewish, that doesn't render the entire religion completely wrong. And as a matter of fact, not only in this argument, but in most of the arguments you hear, they put the cart before the horse. Right, the car is before the horse and this argument in particular they put the cart before the horse and even then as a matter of fact this argument is wrong and it has a Nestorian assumption now bear with me this is going to be going into Christology so some people that are not familiar with Christology might be confused but we will say uh, that Christ, that Jesus, is not a Jewish person. But then we will say that Jesus is Jewish in his humanity. So, what do I mean by it? Well, the person, the, the Jesus in the New Testament and the Old Testament, as I said before in this video, they're the two of the same people, right? They're the same person. <clears throat> so Jesus' personhood did not change. He's not this composite middle Hypostasis. He's not this this divine human person. Now, don't don't misunderstand me. We're not saying that uh, Jesus is not human. Jesus. We're not saying Jesus is not uh, hundred percent human, hundred percent God. That's not what we're saying. Jesus is human, and Jesus is God. But when we're talking about personhood, Jesus is a divine person. He assumed a impersonal human nature. And if he assumed, otherwise if he assumed personal human nature, then Nestorianism will be correct. But he assumed a impersonal human nature. So the person, the word of God, it's the same person. So when we're worshipping Jesus, we're not worshipping a Jew. We're worshipping a divine person. We're worshipping a divine hypostasis. Okay, we're not worshiping his Jewishness. <laughs> but again, if you if in a way, yes, Jesus is Jewish, and him being Jewish, I mean he must be Jewish because that's the only way the Bible can even make sense because the Old Testament constantly talks about a Jewish Messiah. But as I uh, but and this might be this might be kind of hard to understand, but I would like to repeat that personhood his personhood does not change he's still a divine person the hypostatic union doesn't destroy his humanity however right so in the incarnation he did become human he's fully divine fully human but he's a divine person 
and <clears throat> that will cover all of the objections that I have. Thank you all for watching this video and I'll see you guys in the next video. God bless all of you.